thank you. Uh, thanks very much for that, and thanks for having us today. Um, I just wanted to have a show um, everyone here today. We've um, been playing in the EV, vehicle EV space since about 2006, and um, really piggyback off Michael and Claire in regards to talking about um, how we started evaluating EVs and how we got into them, and also demonstrating some actual life cost, um, full life cost of the vehicles compared to uh, some vehicles of a similar size. Just arrow across, do I? Yep. There. So, um, essentially, um, why did we put them into our fleet? What was the selection process at the time? Um, there were two manufacturers that came out around about 2011, 2012. What's it been like for our staff who have been driving those vehicles and the performance of them? What is the actual cost of ownership? So this is real life, um, factual. Um, what's it done to our fleet performance overall? Um, talk a little bit about other sustainability measures we have in our fleet, like our electric bikes, um, how we're involved in some car share services across the city of Melbourne and what we're up to next. Um, how did we get started? Uh, we got started in about 2006 when the Commonwealth Games were in Melbourne and we were trying to find a way of getting our staff in and around um, to all the things that we needed to get around to. So we brought in some electric bikes to trial them. Um, about a year later we had uh, a company called Blade Electric Vehicles and there might be some people here that might know of Ross Blade from back in the old days. He had a, a, a Vic government grant essentially to convert Hyundai Getzes at the time um, into full EVs. Um, we ended up buying three vehicles, I think, through Blade Energy. It didn't cost us a lot of money. Most of it was funded by the state government and Sustainability Victoria. But it was a real um, step forward, I guess, for our, for our council to, uh, to head down that path. Um, the benefits of doing that, I guess, we were supporting low, um, local manufacturing. The vehicles were zero emissions um, and it didn't cost us a lot of money. Unfortunately, the vehicles themselves weren't reliable. So if we put them into our pool fleet, a lot of our staff members would take those vehicles out and they'd break down. And then, so their experience with EVs became a negative experience. Then, uh, Victorian Department of Transport started an EV trial to promote um, electric vehicles. Nissan came on board with the LEAF, Mitsubishi came on board with the IMEV. Um, we took part in that trial from the get-go and as a result, we were able to uh, evaluate both of those two EVs when they came out. So valuation is no different to what Mike was doing. Obviously, his is on a much bigger scale with Australia Post. We wanted to make sure that the performance was great, that they were reliable, that they were comfortable, that they were safe, um, and that they had enough size for the type of work that we wanted them to do. Um, government pricing was available on both the models at the time. We chose the LEAF then. Uh, because the more suitable match for our operational requirements. And we started buying them. Um, they came out in 2012. We bought nine of them in between 2012 and 2014. We've still got them in our fleet. Um, we paid full noise for the first few, and as the years went by, Nissan reduced the price of them. The last three or four that we bought, I think we had a $17,000 discount. Um, so they were coming in cheaper than a Prius. What did our staff think of them? So as I said, we took a little bit of time to get them going because they had a bad experience with the blades. Um, but once we actually put them into operation, not just in our operational fleet, but in our pool fleet as well, um, the first time users were apprehensive. Um, we over overcame that through induction. So through our corporate transport office, we'd get people in the car, we'd sit in with them, we'd show them how to operate, and we'd take them for a drive. Um, and Overall, the experience and continues to uh, the continued experience has been really, really positive. Um, they're surprised by how quick they start off. Um, great acceleration. The Leafs, which were built in 2012, came with cruise control and sat nav and air conditioning. They're five star ANCAP rated. Um, they were, they've been really robust and reliable, and they're comfortable. Um, only one of them, one out of the nine, uh, had a has broken down on us. It had a problem with the battery cell, went to Nissan. Nissan replaced it, uh, the vehicle till they got it fixed. All done under warranty. They get serviced every six months. 
Um, and to this point, so some of them are up to seven years old now, um, they're not showing, or they're showing very little battery degradation at all. So what that means is that the energy consumption or kilowatts per 100 kilometres um, has been really the same from the day we bought them till now. So they're not dropping in reliability and economy. And parts are available. So if they do get bashed up, and God knows our cars get bashed up, um, we have parts, there is parts around to replace them. We use an external consultant to evaluate the Nissan Leafs. So we're, we're fortunate enough with our charging stations, it captures the energy that we put into each individual vehicle. So we can actually analyse each vehicle from the day we started to the day that we sell them. Um, we do that through a network of charging stations which are in our corporate car park. Um, and each individual vehicle's got a little tap on. So you tap on your charging station, it turns it on, charge up your car. And that can be done from a variety of manufacturers of charging stations. We just recently had four, three new installations through Jet Charge, Charge Fox, and it's exactly the same method. So overall, with our nine of these, or nine Nissan Leafs, we've travelled nearly 300,000 kilometres. We've used 72,000 kilowatt hours. An overall economy kilowatt hours per 100 kilometres is 24.1. Um, the new Ionic that some of you might have driven today is 15. So in five years' time, six years' time, the efficiency of these EVs has almost uh, doubled. Average weekly travel, about 1,200 k's. We, we've monitored them for 16,000 days. We've saved 31,500 litres of fuel. We've saved 67, nearly 68,000 kilograms of uh, greenhouse gas. The cost of ownership, this is a big one for fleets. And it's great that Claire showed us uh, that model. And Claire's right, it's really difficult to compare electric vehicles to combustion engines because we've sold very little of them in Australia. And even at the City of Melbourne, the nine that we have, we're not going to start selling those until next financial year. So once again, we've had to make a couple of assumptions. We've made an assumption that when I did this actual total cost of ownership around about November last year, that if we did sell them, we'd get about seven grand for them. If you look in car sales or records of what Nissan Leafs have been sold recently, they're getting somewhere between 10 and 12, so I've been really conservative. Um, the, these vehicles are purchased too, so they're not leased. So if, obviously if you're leasing your fleet, um, there's a different equation altogether. So what I did was I plucked out when we bought them, when we sold them, um, and there's a 2013 Holden Cruze, 13, 2013 Hyundai i30, 2012 Nissan Leaf. Cars about the same age, cars about the same size, cars used for exactly the same thing in our business operations. So they're a pool car or they're an operational car. And what's, um, this is the annual cost or the 12 month cost of those vehicles while we're having them. So you can see if you were to run a Holden Cruise or if we were to run a Holden Cruise, we're looking at around about $11,800 a year to run it. And that includes obviously depreciation, your purchase price, your sale price. 2013 Hyundai diesel was just over six grand. And the Nissan Leaf came in around about seven grand. So very little difference between one of the most efficient, cheapest cars to run in fleet as compared to an EV. Um, obviously you could put in Toyota Corolla with that Hyundai i30, maybe Mazda 3 in that size. They are low cost vehicles. The Leaf stacks up. The proviso is, as Claire mentioned before, that we're looking at holding on to those cars, those EVs, for a longer period of time. With those particular models, the Holden Cruise, Hyundai's, we'd probably have them for about three years. We've been able to prove that the EVs that are manufactured, or whether the Nissans anyway, have been reliable enough to hang on to them for that little bit longer. Um, and the cars you're driving today, the Hyundai's out here, have got a warranty period of five years, I think a battery warranty period of eight years. So you can be pretty comfortable with extending the life of those vehicles in your fleet to get that total cost of ownership down. Um, so what has it meant for us at City of Melbourne? Sorry, you probably can't see all of that graph. 
We have uh, emission targets like most, um, obviously all local governments, but most organisations now have emission targets. And we've um, now got a target that's been adjusted recently, 2021 target, um, which is based on a 4.5% annual reduction of our 2011-2012 emissions. And that's across the whole sector. So I guess for fleet, I've just said, well, I'm going to get 4.5% of fleet. Um, the buildings can worry about the buildings and our other parts of the organisation can worry about them. I'm worried about our fleet. So by introducing things like EVs and low emission vehicles, um, reducing the size of engines, reducing the size of the actual size of vehicles when you can, we will be able to hit our 2021 target uh, December 2017 with the same fleet numbers. So it does, do, uh, does make a radical difference to that um, CO2 reduction. Just want to touch on electric bikes quickly. Um, so there's a, a, I think there's a heap of exhibitions for bikes here tomorrow and over the next days. We run about 26 bikes. Um, not all of our staff, we've got about 1,400 staff in total at the City of Melbourne want to ride them and that's okay. It's, it's dangerous riding a bike in the city. We offer um, regular uh, training by trained professional bike trainers. Generally every couple of months we offer it up for about 10 staff so we're trying to proactively promote the use of bikes rather than taking a car out. We're lucky in the city, we've got trams. Um, we walk to most meetings, we're a very small municipality, but we've got bikes as an option, and obviously then we've got our EVs and other vehicles as options as well. So about 26 bikes, about 10 of them are in our pool system, so you can come down and grab a bike instead of a car. Um, and our operational staff use them, our park rangers use them, maternal child health nurses use them. They'll go to visit new mums with their babies, with baby scales in the pannier, um, because it's heaps quicker and it's heaps easier to actually ride to a meeting. Um, so that's just talking about our mix. Obviously there is some OH&S concern. We do what we can to reduce that risk. Um, but what it has done to our carpool fleet usage, um, oh, it's a bit of a hard graph to read then, but essentially we've been able to reduce the number of transactions, pool transactions, that's cars going out on the road every day. Um, from 2017 to 2018, we've been able to reduce it by about 100 transactions a month. Um, so 100 transactions a month, 100 trips, basically. Five trips a day. Seems not that significant, but it is. And this is just the increased bike usage that you see over time. So as we're doing more training, more education, um, getting, spreading the word, um, our e-bike usage has gone, um, is go growing exponentially. It's great. Car share in the city of Melbourne. Um, we've just recently finished off a tender process. We've got seven car share providers that are now going to be operating in the city. Um, they're more than likely operating at other local governments as well. And unfortunately, we've all got different rules on how they operate. Um, but we are actively involved in car share and we have been for a number of years. Our maternal child and health nurses, once again over at Carlton, have had a flexi car car share account for about 10 years. Um, so when they run out of pool cars or bikes, they could just log into car share, go and pick up a car. We have it at our carpool. So when we reach peak demand, we don't want to go out and buy another pool, couple of pool cars. Um, if we have to, there's a, there's a, I think it's a, might be a flexi car as well, about 30 metres away from where our carpool is in the city. And we just book that in if it's available. If not, there's another 100 metres up the road, we'll book in that one. So we have two accounts. It works really well. It's a really nice car too. I think it's an Audi or something. So people are pretty keen to use it. <laughs> not as good as the Nissan Leaf. Um, yeah, so seven operators. Um, we've got some rules around the, how they operate, like all local governments do. I think lo other local governments might do it a little bit better. Um, so what's next for us? We're going to continue buying EVs. We've just ordered four of the Ionics, uh, full EVs, and I think they're due to come in a month or so. We've just put in charging infrastructure for them. They've got a different charge type than the Nissan Leafs, the, the old Nissan Leafs. Um, and what, that wasn't expensive. As Claire mentioned before about this infrastructure, if you think ahead and you can build that EV, that electric platform for fleets and know what you think your capacity is going to be and then double it, um, you're not going to run into trouble down the track. And the wiring up of a charging station 
Jet Charge and Charge Fox came in and put in three stations in half a day, and they're up and running. We, um, we put in a capital bid to keep on buying them, so I'm buying four this year, hopefully buy five next year, and five each year after that until all of our operational fleets EV, and we can start pushing executives to take it up as well. Speaking of which, we've got seven of the Outlander plug-in hybrids. I saw one out here before. I'm not sure if Mitsubishi are going to be down here with their plug-ins over the weekend. They're a great alternative for executives because during the week they can drive to work, we can use their car at work, and we're not using fuel. But on weekends when they're going to the beach or walk with their dog or taking their kids to sport, it becomes a two-litre hybrid. So it really has reduced our fuel consumption. It's made it cheaper for the executives through their salary sacrifice because we've got a really good deal with Mitsubishi Australia. Um, so I think we've got four, maybe five execs now that are in those and they love them. We'll continue to monitor our EV performance. So what we want to be able to do is actually have some real life stats like this where we can say, hey, it's, you know, don't worry about depreciation. Here's where it is because we've tested it and, and share that as much as possible. Um, we'll c continue to promote new technology where possible and we love trialling stuff. So I'd really like to start trialling fuel cell stuff. I know City of Moreland are doing amazing things um, in regards to hydrogen. Um, can't wait to see how that all pans out. Um, there's potential for us maybe to have a hydrogen station at Queen Victoria Market, but. Queen Victoria market's a little bit political at the moment, so we'll see how that all goes. Um, but our goal, our goal, and we have backing from council, we have backing from the organisation because they've seen the results. You've just got to show them the results. Is that all of our operational fleet in particular, um, it's not big, we've got a small fleet of 78 odd cars. Um, is either EV, fuel, PHEV, so your plug-in hybrid fuel cell, um, or at least hybrid. Maybe we can even start with the executives at least hybrid. Uh, that's really all I've got. So um, thanks a lot for having us.